What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. My name is Pat Sheehan with my co-host Dave Martin Swagger. What's going on, man? Hey, Doc. How's it going? You hear about that uh, Robert Pattinson casting? Our yeah, guy? Good. <laughs> more more your guy than our than my than our guy uh, i i would say our but guy he's he is great you know we talked to we reviewed good time you reviewed high life he's been on a bit of a heater in terms of his roles it seems like this movie with uh willem dafoe is getting a lot of buzz at con right, right now and we missed talking about this last week so i wanted to get your thoughts you know big robert pattinson fan can he play Bruce Wayne slash Batman effectively? Uh, yeah. Are you of sure? Of course about he that? can. Yeah, why the fuck not? The, the like, Twilight guy. Oh yeah, the Twilight guy. Of course. Yeah. Uh, no, nah, he's I, he's one of the best actors we've had. He's made so many cool, interesting choices. He's always done well in all these different roles he's taken the past ten years or so, uh, and especially the last five, where he's just been on heater after heater, as you said. So. It's just very exciting. It's very inspired casting. You know, all the names that were thrown out there, uh, both unknowns relatively and household names. You want someone that you feel like can bring something. And like Pattinson, I feel like can bring all kinds of things. He's shown physicality in the rover. He's shown a weird character actor sense in Lost City of Z, uh, manic energy in good time. He can do anything. So I think really... If Matt Reeves is up to the task as we expect him to be in terms of writing and crafting this specific Batman story, I think Pattinson's a fantastic choice to do whatever he's asked to do because I disbelieve in that talent and because we're seeing it manifest every year. And uh, the Lighthouse is getting rave reviews at a con. So, uh, again, unsurprising. He's another good movie and is in it, is good in it. So why would uh, the Batman be different? Batman's a a tough role and and people are really critical of the casting for, I mean, uh, just like anything that we don't like nowadays, there's a petition to change the casting right. of Robert Pattinson by DC fans. Um, I actually really like the casting. I'm more fascinated by them picking someone Pattinson's age though. Pattinson, I think will be great. And uh, I have no doubt he'll be interesting, but I'm assuming this means that they're going to make this more of a younger Batman. I mean, Pattinson, I believe, is 33 right now, probably be about 35 when the movie uh, is released. I'm guessing it's about two years out at this point. If they're yeah, it has a date, 21. So, I mean, that that's a pretty young Bruce Wayne. So I'm fascinated to see where they go with that and how that impacts the story. Yeah, and like at the same time, though, he's not like it's not like he's like Tom Holland age or anything. Right. And DC is really just they're, they're just kind of working movie to movie right now and just focusing on making the first movie good and the next movie good and not really worrying about like the the 30 year plan or anything the way Marvel works. So I think Pattinson's age probably wasn't really much of a factor. They were just trying to get somebody good and get mm -hmm. a good fit for the director and stuff. So uh, but I mean, either way, remember when people were really mad when Heath Ledger was cast as the Joker because he, he wasn't known for. Uh, anything serious at the time? Uh, is this uh, apart from like Brokeback Mountain? It's, it's the same. It's the same concept regarding the the petition. People just and, and frankly, I mean, do any of the people that are making these petitions, these fans, are, have they watched any of the movies that he's been good in recently? Uh, highly un unlikely. So right, they, they only know him as Edward, probably. Uh, I'm also interested to see Batman. who they cast as Catwoman and the Penguin, who are identified as, as the villains in this upcoming film. So Josh Gad is uh, rumored to be the Penguin. He's like teased it a lot. Hasn't been announced, though. That'd be interesting. Yeah, I, I think I'm a little bit more interested in Catwoman because Penguin doesn't really yep. intrigue me as much. But Catwoman, very intriguing, especially because mm -hmm. there's always like that um, kind of like interplay of like, a relationship of sorts with Batman or at least a tension there in their relationship. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot to be talking about and we'll be keeping you up to date with that, but we're going to start off with some TV today. And if you're watching and you've seen Dave talking, you can see we're going to be talking about catch 22, the mini series from Hulu uh, produced and one episode directed by George Clooney. Uh, six episodes starring Charlie Abbott playing John Yosarian also known as Yo-Yo in the show and Air it's Force. Christopher Abbott, not Charlie Abbott. Oh, Christopher Abbott. Yeah, Sorry. of girls fame. 
I, I wrote down the wrong name, so that, that's <laughs> on me. Um, he's play, he plays an Air Force bombardier uh, who is trying to finish his missions and get out of the army. He's furious. People are trying to kill him, but more that the army keeps raising the number of missions that he needs to complete before he can actually get out. Uh, how would you describe this? Is this a drama? Is this a comedy? A little bit of both? Yeah, well, I think the whole whole lens you discuss the, the this miniseries really depends on what you're uh, viewing it as. Are you viewing it as an adaptation of the famous Joseph Heller novel, or are you just viewing it as a miniseries about soldiers in World War II? Uh, the novel, uh, which I haven't read, but it has, was very notorious and, and famous for being uh, a bit of a, a, a satire, a, a, a lot of dark humor, uh, and just kind of just making fun of the whole uh, enterprise of war. And uh, Yo-Yo's character is kind of just fighting to maintain his his sanity, his, his sense of self, while trying to protect his uh, literal life. Um, and that humor that's so famous and, and well-liked in the book um, might come and go in this mini series. So if you're looking for that, it might not be delivering it to you. But if you're just viewing the mini series as a world war II story, I think it's honestly even a simpler thing to analyze. And that's, again, it's basically what I was doing given that I hadn't actually read the book, but I, uh, yeah, I think it, there's definitely like a whimsy, whimsy to it, the, the, this mini series. And it, I mean, the high production values stand out, the big name actors stand out, but it's not just a, it's not just a war story, or at least it's not trying to be just one, whether it's effective at being more than just a war story, I guess, is we'll talk about. But I mean, wh- how did you view it? Because it has a real sense of style and like gravitas to it. Yeah, I probably would view this more as like a dark comedy in, in a lot of ways. And that even though it, it touches on some really uh, deep and dark and thoughtful themes, <laughs> I think where I found myself enjoying this the most were the points where they were doing fun things like especially when uh the plot was being driven by yo-yo's interactions with the other people within the the troop or the the, his his division i guess it is Mm -hmm. uh specifically like milo uh played by daniel david stewart uh electric on screen and just watching them go about was fantastic especially the scene with i, I think it was like the saudi like businessman or whatever where they had to kind of like bullshit with him i i really love that scene um but the interplay he had with all the other men i thought was was great um kyle chandler and hugh laurie and george clooney you know popping out of this at different points and all are fantastic in different ways um but in terms of how I saw the miniseries, I think it, it kind of starts to spiral around the, the end of the third episode into the fourth. Um, you know, especially there's uh, a tragedy that happens on the base that leads to the death of two of the men in the troop. I, I won't spoil it too much, but that kind of starts to drive this downward spiral of uh, Yo-Yo trying to get out of the the army, you know, them blocking him in several different ways. Uh, every time he thinks he's about to finally get his reprieve, they they change the bar or something goes wrong. And it, it finally ends up with him just kind of like hitting rock bottom in this. And uh, it really is like a tragedy in a lot of senses. But where I think the miniseries strives the most is when it adds the levity to it. Yeah, and I mean, Milo's character, just being a blatant war profiteer, is really a well-regarded character from the book, but I think he's very effective in in the miniseries as well, just because he he always has a smile on his face. He's always pleasing everyone he meets. Yet if you just open, uh, you know, the hood for what his enterprise is, the syndicate, this, you know, it's it's, it's pretty nasty stuff. And meanwhile, you know, Yo-Yo obviously is the driving force as the protagonist, his reluctance to continue to have a good attitude about fighting the way some of his uh, uh, squad mates do. You know, I think that, that that that's supposed to be communicated as like he, his interest in self-preservation is based on the uh, lack of uh, importance he feels in these missions and 
he just feels like he's being sent off to eventually die for no reason. Yeah, I don't know if that's communicated well enough and that it's not coming off just as him being like a coward. You know, like I, I was having a it just sounded sometimes it just felt like he was just kind of like bitching out. And it, 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 it didn't didn't it didn't present yo yo as like this thinker of like the human condition and like the ethics of upping these mission counts. It never, it never felt like I tr- totally examined that. Uh, at least Yo-Yo, Yo-Yo never communicated that. So I kind of like struggled sometimes with him just, uh, just bitching about his situation that he really had no control over as he found out. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know if that was always effectively communicated. I do think it gets a little bit better as the the series goes on in ways, um, especially the the last episode when um, he, uh, you know, their, their ship gets hit and one of the, the new men in, in their division and on, on the plane is killed. Um, and there's this the sense of, of like, okay, like I'm, I'm going to help you get through this. Like I'm going to save you. And then he finds out that the injury to the person is much worse. And he actually like, is like faced with like this thing that he feels responsible for in a lot of ways. And um, then, then he refuses to wear his, his uniform ever again because of uh, what happened and how he's feeling about it. And I feel like at that point it starts to be communicated a little bit more effectively, but yeah, I don't know if Christopher Abbott um, ever really makes yo-yo into this person who is like this very like this or i don't know if his thoughtfulness is communicated i think they try to do that with the flashback scenes with marion in different ways mm. but i don't know if that's always done like you said effectively yeah um well and like the whole like dark comic tone that it's the story supposed to have yo-yo never never seems to get any of the jokes he's around like, mm. like the catch the titular catch 22 uh premise uh you know with the insanity and whatnot right apparently that's like this hilarious back and forth in the book and it was kind of just like rushed and said and kind of forgotten mm-hmm. on the show and while i still you know i thought i still you know again i haven't read it like learning and i still thought that worked but it just seemed like it, it, it was it was missing something for and like back to the humor i mean like the whole the whole major major bit is funny but again it's apparently it's much funnier in the book whereas lewis pullman who's bill pullman's son who's playing major major he mm-hmm. i don't know so it just kind of felt like sometimes he was in a different show because he was like one of the only ones that was just kind of being a doof right whereas the only other stuff that was really hammy was like kyle chandler's uh colonel <laughs> character who is very over the top obviously but in a different way. I, I just didn't know if like the, the blatant moments for humor and for uh, like making everything seem like a farce. I just don't know if that really uh, it didn't come up that much apart from Milo, who again, we thought worked well. Definitely. I think uh, I agree with you on, on it not working as well as they were hoping it would. I still think the series was very enjoyable and you mentioned the style of it. It's like almost shot th- through this like sepia tone lens in a lot of ways really mm-hmm. gives you that like old timey feel. And I think the like the costumes in this and like the the way that they they shoot like the setting and everything is really well done and really kind of gives you a sense of place and time, which is is a huge testament to the show. But yeah, I think the acting definitely left a little bit to be desired for sure. And the writing, obviously, as well. Yeah, I mean, they did shoot this in Italy. Uh, it was quite expensive as, as as it looks. And I think they used just two B-25 bombers. And they had to like redo shots and, and rework shots all the time. But they only, they only actually had two planes the whole time, which is uh, pretty, pretty fascinating, having them figure all that out. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I feel like the bookheads will definitely like this a lot more than the uh, 1970 film with Alan Arkin and John Voight and Orson Welles, because I know that was not very well received. And I think adapting this into a movie, it, you just need the, you need more time with all these supporting characters to really dive in and really understand all the uh, over the topness and ridiculousness of all the characters in the whole situation. I feel like a movie just isn't enough time, you mm-hmm. know? No, I agree. Yeah. For so sure. I, I still a big, big fan. I mean, again, there's there's I think if you if you separate it from its source material and just review it for what it is, it's it's uh, very, very enjoyable. 
something else I think we both really enjoyed. Uh, Fleabag season two. Phoebe Waller Bridge. I got it right this time. Um, <laughs> plays Fleabag. Wrote, produced the show. Uh, you know, it's been what three years since the first season came out. Uh, really highly regarded first season kind of flew under the radar because it was, it's a British show came to Amazon, but um, I think not as many people were really aware of it. And then season two came out and pretty much every TV critic out there or fan of TV that was aware of the show was like, Hey, flea back season two. Can't wait. Got to watch it. Um, finally on Amazon, we were able to watch it season two. Give me your thoughts on season one and then kind of, how did you feel about season two compare comparatively? Right. Yeah. Well, I think with season one, it, it immediately grabs you as, I mean, obviously it's a British show, but it's like a very unique British show. And obviously the, what stands out the most is that uh flea bag breaks the fourth wall pretty routinely constantly directly looks in the camera and there's mm-hmm. these hammer lines, but the payoff, the, the punch lines are not what you expect. The first notable one is about anal sex, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. And it's just this really funny shit. And you're like, all right, well, this is going to be like maybe like a, a dark comedy of sorts about this bad girl. Uh, we've seen this in girls. We've seen this in lots of stuff. Right. Cool. That'll be good. Uh, charismatic performer, good writer. But then you realize, oh, wait, there's actually a lot more going on in this show. And it's about, you know, examining uh, like the walls you put up in your relationships and whole whole mess of themes, really. Yeah. But, but it immediately grabs your attention for the how the storytelling is different. And season two manages to kind of up that ante in a uh, awesome way, unexpected way. But I mean, see, the reason season two is so uh, on everyone's radar this time around is, you know, since between one and two, uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge developed Killing Eve and did season mm-hmm. one as a showrunner, was a voice in Solo, and is now one of the co writers on Bond 25 kind of a yep. big fucking deal <laughs> yeah and she helped uh write and produce on crashing which was an hbo show I actually recently had its final season wrap up or it was cut short uh yep. canceled but she's uh, obviously a rising voice in creative fields tv fields movie fields um season one for me what, what i think you know you, you hit on many of the great points i think what also stood out was just how endearing in and how realistic she's able to make almost every character in the show in different ways i mean i think the only character i really absolutely despise in season one is claire's husband (laughs) um who's just he's the the worst yeah you're supposed to dislike him even olivia coleman's godmother who uh i think could be detestable in a lot of times in the show i think he is is a more fleshed out character than you see in a lot of shows and there's not really a lot of wasted space. Like it's, these are 22, 24 minute episodes and she's doing a lot to really build out this world and make all these characters feel realized. And I think she actually continues that into season two in a really wonderful way. Um, you know, Andrew Scott who plays the priest in season two, um, is just a wonderful addition. A uh, clear standout him and, uh, Waller bridge have amazing chemistry on screen together and even though he gets a lot of time in season two he never feels like he's there too much i'm actually really interested to learn more about him he feels like a real person in a lot of ways too um i think that that's probably the part about the show i like the most you know even a character like claire who is very like flat and cold a lot of the time and takes herself very seriously i found myself loving and hating her with the with Fleabag throughout the show and like my emotions towards Claire were up and down. I think that's just a testament to how well written and developed this, that this idea is. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it, it, it's actually kind of funny. This like Olivia Coleman's character is just the godmother and Phoebe Waller Bridge yeah. is just Fleabag. Like there's no name there. Right. And like in yep. season two, we just have the priest and yeah, the lawyer guy is literally called hot misogynist like on the call sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And uh the, the loan officer is just loan officer. And who and uh, I think what that communicates it, it continues with the storytelling is everything is through the lens of how Fleabag perceives everything. Mm-hmm. And that also includes obviously the camera. Like we're supposed to be like there watching it. And season two, having the priest 
see when Fleabag like looks at the camera or talks to it, then eventually starts hearing what she says. Mm-hmm. Is is just a fascinating way to keep that going. And then the way this show ends, and like this is gonna be the last fleet well, feedback for a very long time. As she says the last season could that could change, but for a while anyway. And having the camera not follow Fleabag as she walks away and having Fleabag like wave from afar, like I it is it's really unique mm-hmm. way to communicate like the viewer's relationship with what they're watching yeah. while also communicating the protagonist's view of everything that we're watching happen. This is really cool. It, it's uh, I agree. I think it's really cool and that's actually highlighted really well in I think it was episode three when she goes to visit the the therapist or the counselor that the father pays Fiona Shaw killing you. Yes. Awesome. Um, but when when she asks, like, oh, do you have any friends that you talk to? And she says no at first. And then like later on, she comes back to this like, oh, actually, no, I do have friends I talk to. And then she like wink, she like, looks over at the camera. She might even give it a wink. And it's like, oh, she's like nodding to you as like this, these are you know, the friends she's developed for herself mm-hmm. to like cope with this. And obviously it relates back to like her her guilt and her trauma and her feelings around what happened with Boo um, mm-hmm. prior and kind of what is kicking off her her journey in these two seasons and what she's ultimately dealing with. Um, but it's it's just really really smart and really well done and it's such a delight to get through i almost feel like uh a bit cheated that there's only 12 episodes in total because this is a show i would like to spend a lot more time in that's a that's british shows for especially british comedies they're usually usually tight um but i mean the dialogue too because phoebe waller bridge mm-hmm. is i feel is like a writer first even though she's a awesome performer the dialogue is it seems is very realistic and it's like none of the jokes ever feel forced. Like everything just feels so natural throughout time. And you really understand the characters and all their lines feel like they would be coming from, you know, who they're coming from. Everything feels mm-hmm. feels right. And even someone like Claire's husband, who is definitely more of a high energy dick as far as dicks go, um, it, it, it lands well. And I mean, season two for me, like immediately just grabbed my eye because the first episode that like, classic uh dinner gone wrong scene with yeah. the family everyone's just on 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 edge the whole time and every every line has so much uh uh under the surface you know yeah. uh, it, it's great and actually they introduce the priest in such a really smart way and having i think andrew scott's really good in the role but having him have his own arc in the season and then the way it ends yeah. which we probably didn't didn't expect it to end that way mm-hmm. um it's really lovely. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, I think the like the the like the subtle things that they did really well in season two, I think actually elevated the show from season one. So while Waller Bridge has those moments where she looks at the camera and she like gives a wink or adds a comment and that kind of adds a lot of context about her character. When Andrew starts to like notice that and that adds a whole nother element to like what Fleabag is going through what she's experiencing her different feelings around it it's really like the idea of like being seen by somebody and probably for the first time in Fleabag's life because while she's kind of like the linchpin of her family and you see that um, in the episode where you know I think it's the final episode where like the father and the godmother are getting married Mm -hmm. and she's kind of the one holding everything together in a lot of ways she's also the one that people just see as like the damaged one it's the one who is always making a scene, always making things about her when in a lot of ways, no more miscarriages today. <laughs> right, exactly. And um, in, in a lot of ways, she developed that that tendency because of the tragedy in her family with her mom dying, you know, and it's it's just su- such a layered show in so many ways. And, uh, you know, it it makes you really think about family relationships in I think ways that other shows don't necessarily um, always get to. And I, I mean, if you weren't already uh, buying in on Phoebe Waller bridge, uh, you really need to start because I have a feeling we're going to be talking about her for a really long time. Yeah, for sure. Also shout out Andrew Scott, who I swear looks like Shea Wiggum's younger brother. <laughs> it's a good call. A um, good call. I actually didn't realize he was a uh, Moriarty on Sherlock. That's where he got. Yeah, he got famous. Also, he's an openly gay actor playing a non-gay character. It can be done. Normalize that some more. Also, the <laughs> best. I think my favorite bit in the whole 
whole season, which only happens twice, I think, was the whole thing where the painting falls down when God's referenced or God's yeah. on the mind. It's hilarious. I like audibly laughed aloud both times. <laughs> yeah were, were there any like moments or scenes that really stood out to you from either season um the whole dinner episode for sure yeah uh, I, I actually really liked the episode at um claire's work like work mm-hmm. party work event thing with the with the awards <laughs> and then having and, uh, that up that 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 scene stolen. afterwards at the bar with the with the winner yes um was really good i mean i had the the, the statue yeah, the voluptuous statue that gets stolen and returned and regifted and all that uh, is another good bit. And the kind of where that statue goes or who has it kind of represents, I think, the flea bag's status at the time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, th- the show always grabs your attention because at any any given point, if you look away, you could miss a look at the camera, you know, mm-hmm. like then you just you miss the, the the punch of the scene. So you have to pay attention the whole time. Yeah. Uh, you know, w- when I think about the show, probably the episode that comes to mind most is actually from season one, which is the silent retreat <laughs> that they go to. And <laughs> I just found that episode so funny and just so like, uh, I don't know, there's so many moments from it. I remember um, like when she when she sneaks up on the guy screaming at the female mannequin, like just hilarious like i don't know the whole thing and then, i definitely like, turned I was... my tv down when like <laughs> slut was being yelled like 50 times in like a 10 minute period hilarious and then afterwards the the conversation she has with the loan manager is just so like right i don't know it's so intimate but also like opens your eyes about who he is and like it makes his like decisions and what he like goes and what he's going through feel so real it's just like i feel like that embodies what the show does really well um on a great level i also just that that final episode where they're at the the father and godmother's house and you know uh, claire begs the husband to leave her and just everything going on there this this uh what, what was it like oboe or whatever the the weird a bassoon the bassoon yeah uh his, the biggest his... wind instrument <laughs> that that song was called where's claire just like <laughs> <What's> so <laughs> many so many different uh funny things the the priest um giving that speech love it's it's terrible it's, yeah it's terrible <laughs> so funny uh yeah D- delight of a show so um too bad there's not gonna be more but definitely check it out on amazon why don't we move on to what happens in the shadows? What happens? What we do in the shadows, the Taiko Waititi uh, adaptation from his uh, film back in what early 2010s. 2014, now in, I think. It's 2014. Kind of, kind of recent. Yeah. Eh, five years, half a decade. Crazy. Um, mm-hmm. And into a, a 10 episode TV show. So we uh, got Jermaine Clement. At the the helm of this thing, play the Concords. Uh, you know, also we, in the original we, movie. Yes, and we talked about the uh, we talked about this as an anticipated movie or TV show for the year, something we were looking forward to. Haven't really talked about it much on the pod. W- what was your overall thoughts on on this season and and just kind of I think this this brand of humor in whole? Yeah, I think right away it. Uh, you either get on board or you're not going to really vibe with it because it the show doesn't really change throughout the season. It's kind of the same thing the whole time, but I think it's actually just, it's kind of like really well realized in terms of what they're trying to do with these vampires living in the real world and fish out of story, fish out of water story tropes and whatnot. So if you like that and like the, for the pilot, like kind of hooks you, then all the ridiculous things they do throughout the season will be amusing to you. And that's where I was. I actually thought it was, it was quite funny because it's a, it's a short show. It's like 20 something minute episodes. You know, it's, it's pretty light, but also just unique enough that I think it, it's, it's pretty pleasurable. What about you? I agree that the show doesn't change much throughout. However, I found myself a lot more in the middle. There were some episodes where I didn't really find myself grabbed too much, but there are others where I was all in like the, uh, what was it? The, where the, the council scene, I think it was, yeah. or the, the council the episode. Council. I thought hilarious. And our greetings seeing, <laughs> seeing all, you know, Tilda Swinton pop up, Danny Trejo, 
uh, tra- Treo, um, yep. all of, like those different people pop up as being Wesley on the council. Snipes. Just, yes, just Meta's like fun. hilarious. Um, Taiko Atiti was also in there. Dave yeah. Bautista was one of the imprisoned people. Like it, it I thought Paul like Ruben. those episodes, or or when Nick Kroll uh, was in the, yep. the nightclub episode, I thought Manhattan. Those, yes, I thought those people injected an energy into it that the show kind of sometimes could fall into this very. Um, I don't know the same lull, so to speak, that I think lost me at times. But overall, I thought that this was a really fun uh, first season, and I'm looking forward to them doing more. Um, you know, uh, the orgy episode is probably my favorite of the season, though, and that didn't really have many like guest people in it. Kind of con- contrast to what I'm saying, but I just felt like Matt Barry in that one got to yeah kind of shine more, uh, whereas I feel like. Kayvon uh, Novak really carried a lot more of the funny moments for me early in the season. Him and Guillermo had a great chemistry together. Um, and I really liked that Matt Barry got a chance to really like show off in that one. Yeah, I, honestly, I thought Matt, Matt Barry had lots of lots of funny, funny line one liners throughout the season. But I was actually kind of un- unexpectedly um, Mark Prost, who plays uh, Colin Robinson, the uh, mm-hmm. The Daywalker, the energy vampire. The energy vampire, yeah. And then he gets like a bottle episode of sorts early in the season at his office. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever he's whenever he's uh, in, it's just like lots of cool physical comedy because he can't fly, he can't turn into a bat, he can be out in the day, all that stuff. So because he's different than the other vampires and uh, looks and dresses like a normal person, it's just, it's just easy jokes. Um, Doug Jones is the Baron, obviously. Doug Jones mm-hmm. is playing a character and heavy makeup and prosthetics shocker there. Um, I was happy the Baron didn't last throughout the whole season just because I don't know. I, I, he was like, he was like almost like too serious for the rest mm-hmm. of the show. And yes, they were like kind of making fun of him throughout, but I was kind of happy he uh, had, had his, 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 his arc, I guess if you could call it that. Um, did I you do like- love the, uh, before you move on from the bear, I do love his arrival when he just like comes out of the the coffin and just immediately like sucks all the blood out of their like what is, like whatever that was that familiar keeper familiar. whatever it was just, yeah. just destroys her dude. It's hilarious. Like and then blood he goes is back to sleep in like five minutes. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, what were you gonna say though? Yeah. Um. Did you like that? Like, there's like a documentary crew filming it, and it's there's a lot like like Novak often will look at the camera. And just give it a nod. Obviously, it's not like flea bag level, like uh, fourth wall breaking. But because like they even have like confessional scenes where they're talking to the camera and talking about stuff, uh, I think it just kind of helped uh, frame the humor and absurdity of everything. So, I mean, did you like that? Yeah, I, I think that that can be a uh, a choice, a narrative choice that can be hit or miss. You know, like The Office is probably the best example of that being a hit parks and recreation um but i thought that that actually added a lot to the show and i really enjoyed um a lot of their their interviews thinking back to the orgy episode which is on my mind for some reason as we're talking about this uh when they were talking about vampire orgies and framing that for the episode and like what the stakes were for the episode so to speak and how if you have a bad one you know like is talked about for thousands of years and you never get to live it down. And I really felt yeah. like, and they were showing like these pictures and that really added to it. And I was like, this is just a really great way to like add in these little jokes and these little things that add so much to the episodes. But, but mm-hmm. um, and it's a simple choice, you know, it's, it's easy to do. So I thought that was great. Overall, I thought the show was a really big success and FX, I, you know, I think they've had some shows come out that, haven't been what they want them to be. And I think we'll be talking about that a little bit uh, in the coming weeks with Fosse Verdon, which seems to have been um, not as big as they were hoping it would be. But what we do in the shadows seems to be an absolute uh, hit for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Shout out the uh, werewolf episode. But that was really funny. <laughs> uh, the animal control mm-hmm. one. Just all the Staten Island digs. I thought are really funny. If you understand New York City. Um and overall, you know, it's cool that they don't like they show them being vampires pretty frequently, whether that's them flying or hovering around or sucking people's blood. Like they don't skimp on that, which I think was uh, mm-hmm. which is good. You know, they actually they, they do feel like fantastical creatures in the normal world, which is, I think, important uh, to make the jokes work. 
Also, shout out Beanie Feldstein, just kind of being a, yes. a bit player in the season. I just saw her in Book Smart, and it's definitely uh, uh, he's asked uh, less of in this season. Hopefully, she gets to do more in season two as her profile has risen. But I thought so, even in her limited screen time, she was still pretty funny. Yeah, I really liked the episode where uh, Natasha Dimitrios Nadja was kind of like teaching her how to, how to be a vampire. I thought that episode was fantastic <laughs> and she got to really shine in that. <laughs> uh, and like the the weird bat that she turns into is just like, yeah. I, I, I literally like spit out my water. Yeah, as I was, as I was drinking. It's hilarious. Um, any last thoughts on what we do in the shadows before we move on? Cool. No, That's, I think it's definitely worth it and easy to get through. So you can catch up late like we did. Uh, we're, we're not talking a lot of music this week. We're saving it for next week, but we did want to mention this Beast Coast album uh, that came out. We've been kind of leading up to it and uh, anticipating it for a little bit. I think we talked about it on the pod uh, that this was going to be coming out. You know, a team up of the Underachievers, Flatbush Zombies, Pro Era, and they dropped Escape from New York this past Friday. What were your thoughts? I, I know that you were highly anticipating this. Yes. Yeah, I've seen all of these artists live. I think I've, I've seen Joey four times, I think. Um, so I was a big fan of all of them as their own entities for a long, very long time. And the Beast Coast movement has been a thing for a while, too. But the culmination in terms of a true like group slash collective uh, effort has been much hyped. And with a lot of writing on it, I was uh, actually a really big fan of this. I uh, thought they delivered it didn't there, there were a bunch of things i was worried might happen in terms of it feeling samey or stale or old but no i think as all these artists have evolved throughout their careers you can you see that you hear that on this album i think that was great great choice it, it's it seems like they put a lot of time into making this the way they've put a lot of time into honing the craft so i was a, i was a big fan i mean what did you think as someone who's uh, not as hardcore as me yeah i thought this was a very good album um not not one of the best of the year for me but i thought it was well made it flowed really well uh i was a little bit surprised that the energy level was not really high the whole time i guess i was kind of expecting that going in so then you know after the first two or so songs they hit this stretch from uh problems to snow in the stadium which is this very like reggae influenced song yes. and um it's actually very like mellowish you know in terms of the beat and just the overall feeling in the songs and i was kind of like huh this this is different than what i was, I was expecting but it's still really well done and I actually thought the production on this was like some of the best of the year because I felt like even though the songs feel very singular and this is something we talked about um, with Igor last week, I still feel like they flowed really well, like particularly um, in the back half of the album, the transition from distance to bones. It's like one of the smoothest transitions from songs on that I can like really remember when the songs aren't actually just like together. It was really awesome. So some great moments in this. I thought very solid overall and i was pleased uh it seems like you were as well yeah and to do the beats i mean i was just actually running it back not all the credits are public yet but powers pleasant from pro air the producer he made a few of them but actually eric the architect eric Arg Elliott from flatbush zombies made i think four of the beats and he's always been known as like the polymath of flatbush zombies makes the beats and raps well but it's kind of cool that they there's, and there's a, I think there's another producer duo that's on a few of these songs too. I didn't recognize their name, uh, but it's cool. That there's a bunch of different producers, and that it still sounds really cool because I was expecting it to be like all powers or something. Um, but I mean, this album, you know, it's it's hard to make a group album work well because there's just so many voices, and they're all they're all unique enough that you know it can just kind of sound like you're just stringing verses and tech cutting and pasting them together, right? I mean. There's four pro era guys rapping on this. Underachievers is a duo. Flatbush is a trio. That's a lot of people. And I think overall, they kind of spread the wealth pretty well. Um, it felt like I think Joey and maybe Nick Caution were probably at the lower end in terms of just less verses. But 
I never felt like any of the songs were just like, all right, let's add the CJ verse now to this song. Like nothing ever really wore out its welcome for me, which is, you know, you don't, you don't want everything to be six minutes long when you have this many guys. So I think they really, both the production and the sequencing and then just the overall song construction just sounds like they put a lot of time into, into making this work and not overdoing anything, which again, is just something you could be, we've seen often with albums with this many people involved. Yeah, I was wondering, and I have an answer to this, but I was wondering if you felt like one group had more influence or this sounded more like one of the group's albums more than a collective. Uh, definitely. That question, yeah, that's what I felt like, too. That felt like they had more of a of influence on what this record actually sounded like than right. Pro Era or the underachievers yeah it sounds old it's it's closest in sound to vacation from hell latin flatbush's album last year which we reviewed um which i think is a good thing to model after because that was an album that and we didn't love it but it did what flatbush has been famous for in terms of these dark cloudy introspective raps but also is not opposed to adapting the sound to more modern modern things and i think meech and meech is all over this we already talked about eric uh, his production actually juice actually surprised me he does a lot of different hooks on this and he doesn't immediately sound like himself and then someone like kirk knight who we also reviewed his last solo album he has really adapted the past few years into being a bit more of a crossover hip-hop artist and he kind of fits right into what flatbush was doing on their last album so he fits right into a lot of these hooks i know uh coast clear i think that was the second single didn't really do much for me as a single, but once I heard this at the end of the album, I actually really like that song now. And Kirk actually really impressed me because I was a bit iffy on him being a crossover artist when we talked about that solo album. We got some hate on that review as a result, but I think he's kind of honed that a little bit and it sounds a lot better on this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously I would love more Joy verses. I would love more Issa verses, but I think what we got is still really good. Uh, definitely very good any uh songs that particularly stand out to you yeah so you mentioned that there's a, there's the chill vibe there's the the third eye vibe that we come to expect from a lot of these guys not as much of the high energy that they initially bust on the scene for right however when you get that high energy it's fucking great because there's mm-hmm. they can still do it like they always have i thought bones was fucking yes clap for zombies isa's uh versus is fucking textbook him uh six nine discs on there i love hearing that from new york artists by the way that would, i mean i just wrote in my notes bones holy shit <laughs> <laughs> i love nick's verse on puke uh mentioned coast clear rubber band i thought that hook was really good problems in the beginning really again it, it, the chill vibe presents mm-hmm. itself early um left hand one of their lead singles i think that song was still really well done they performed that on late night and it was cool live um but it, it doesn't not all these songs they don't all feel like oh this is the posse cut where we got 30 dudes on it right like they, they, it just sounds like like a big group album and i think that that's hard, easier said than none also shout out the track uh length 47 minutes mm-hmm. which is a reference to the 47 lifestyle from the pro era uh come up with capital steez that's a cool little easter egg for the og fans that most people won't pick up on but yeah, I'm a big fan of this. I'm going to run this back a lot. Are you going to catch them on tour? That's the problem. I'm planning to be away when they're here. They're playing at an outdoor arena this time around. We actually saw Joey once. So I want to go. I mean, I've seen all these guys before, but I've never seen them together all at once. I feel like it's this is kind of like a moment that won't, won't be that easy to see after this year. So I, I probably should probably should go. Check out our playlist, Nostalgia Best of 2019, on Spotify. Uh, we've already added Bones to the playlist, so you can uh, take take a taste there and then check out the rest of the album if you like it. Uh, a, another uh, album that I think we both enjoyed, but more of a surprise, also a visual poem, is Lonely Islands, the unauthorized Bash Brothers experience. Uh, Andy Samberg just loves these sports satire comedies. What the fuck does visual poem mean? Nothing. Like, when I when I, when I like heard about this because I'm not like a hardcore 
Lonely Island fan, so I wasn't aware of the teases of this project until they really did it in earnest the past few days. But like visual poem, like like that that means nothing. It's a made up thing, right? <laughs> like well, don't, don't don't tell me this is like lemonade or anything. It's not. It's just ultimately it's visuals for this quick album they made, right? Right, and but it's, that, it's almost that, like it's it's not quite tour de pharmacy or seven days in hell as you've been referencing. Like mm-hmm. Andy likes these sports things, but I was actually surprised that there's like way less plot this time around. This is really just like a bunch of music videos. Yeah, I mean, even the uh, they, they use the Jose Canseco, Mark McGuire in the late nineteen eighties with the o- Oakland mm-hmm. Athletics, the Bash Brothers hitting all these home runs because they were roided out of their minds at this time, uh, and that's kind of what the the theme of, of the album is around. But even a lot of the songs on here are very loosely connected to that, and I mean, that's just like a general. I mean, they they have a lot of baseball references, and sometimes are more directly referencing things that actually happened in these people's lives, but like the Haim song uh, or the the one where Sterling K. Brown pops in and uh, Sia for Oakland Nights. Oakland Nights. Like that, that that could just be a Lonely Island song. Like it doesn't yeah. need to be related to them at all. Um, you know, I, I for the visual part, because there, there's I think there's the music to talk about and then the actual Netflix drop. Uh, I, it definitely was supposed to be a satire on something like Lemonade or... Uh, mm-hmm. Janelle Monae's you know Great visual theater, album yeah. just things like that uh, uh, because this has been more of a trend recently where artists are putting out these visual albums to accompany an album and really add some artistic perspective or uh, add something to what they're trying to say and I actually thought that was some of the the stuff I found funniest was like in between songs like the just nonsense yeah. that they were saying and the visuals that went along with it i was just like these are this is some of the most ridiculous shit i've probably seen on tv this year um but i also thought the songs were pretty good you know lonely island for being uh you know a comedy group uh really can make songs that are still just enjoyable i mean everybody knows like i'm on a boat or i just had sex but i think there's a, a bunch off here that are actually kind of bangers what'd you think yeah well i was impressed with the visuals for it, the visuals whether you think there's enough substance there look great yeah and like the production values are very very present and that does lend itself to the music as well which sounds good mm-hmm. um this is the first time listening to them where i realized they're like shortcomings as rappers because they've always kind of been like joke rappers this whole time more or less um mm-hmm. but it did seem like they had the same exact flow every time they rapped yeah whether it's on less bash or any of these other songs and these songs are funny but then when i hear it i'm like wait they're doing the same rap mm-hmm. hat why do you have to listen to this rap like it's the same pitter patter the whole time and it, it started to wear on me at the end but the songs are just stu- super funny because they're just ridiculous which is what you expect <laughs> from them so if that's what you want then you're going to get that and be happy with it. And I still found it very funny. Yeah. And I, I, if you're coming to Lonely Island looking for anything else, that's on you because right. I mean, it's Andy Sandberg. He thrives in that lane of just like idiotic, ridiculous, stupid comedy. Um, and he's obviously the most well-known one, but Akiva Schaefer, who also was a co-director for this, uh, for the visual at least, I thought it was hilarious playing Mark McGuire, who was, I guess, like a pseudo straight man in part of this. Well, Sam Bird yeah. got to be like I'm ridiculous. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Jose. I'm Mark. <laughs> I just, uh, so many little funny elements. Well, you know, they also had quite a few guest appearances. Um, yeah. Haim, Maya Rudolph, Sterling K. Brown, Sia sang a hook on this. I mean, mm-hmm. they got some big names in this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that stands out early. I didn't really like Oakland Nights as a, as a song. Actually, anytime they really used auto tune, I thought it sounded pretty pretty bad. But having Sterling K. Brown be Sia in in for the visual, it's just really funny. Yeah, you know, it, it's tough to tough to take that away from them. Yeah, silk robes and kimonos, bro. Um, <laughs> what what do you think of of Haim and and Maya Rudolph on IHOP parking lot? Yeah, that's funny. That's obviously a play on lots of old school movie ideas, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think just <laughs> anytime they're like like sexualizing Mark and Jose, it's it's really good. Like it's kind of like a follow up to when they're doing the weight room scene where they're lifting the girls like yeah it's funny it's it's you know i was um in for the visual it, it uh it really jumps from song to song pretty quick like i mean the whole album's like 20 something minutes long and the visual is like 30 minutes but the plot if you could call it one <laughs> uh kind of jumps around a lot but it doesn't really matter because they just throw you into this next song usually it's a high energy song so yeah, it, it's fun. Yeah, the definitely. cameos are cool, and that kind of speaks to the the success these guys have had for a very long time. Like Sandberg has a high profile right now mm-hmm. from Brooklyn Nine Nine, and obviously he was already well very well known from SNL. So uh, these guys have some pull, and I'm sure Netflix was happy to add this to the the content mine. They're just like, oh, you want to make something weird that we can pseudo promote midweek? Yeah, fuck it, why not? Like it, it was a it's low stakes for everyone. Exactly, and it, I, I thought it was a. Uh, uh, pleasant uh delightful surprise drop uh probably my favorite surprise of 2019 to this point I and mean, we haven't had too too many of them else is there uh not, i'm trying to think if there's been any like surprise album drops this year not none that i can think of but something that definitely was not surprised that we've been anticipating for a while has been aladdin point aladdin 2019 i guess we'll, we'll call it will smith's aladdin however mm-hmm. you want to refer to it but the guy Richie helmed uh live action remake of the what 1992 mm-hmm. 1992 damn uh animated movie uh starring Mena Musad as Aladdin Naomi Scott as Jasmine obviously we got Will Smith as the genie Marwin Kamari as Jafar uh and Nassim Come on, pronounce these right Ken Zari bro can you read <laughs> oh i i sorry i just i it's just my terrible handwriting more than <laughs> um and it, na, how do you say na, this seems last name I'm, i don't want to butcher it uh padrad padrad okay SNL alum. yeah I, I don't really recall her from snl which is yeah, probably uh i just wasn't super tuned in at that time uh playing dahlia the handmaid to jasmine um yeah, I guess why don't we just start with general thoughts? How did you feel about Aladdin overall? I liked it a lot more than I expected to. I know, uh, I think for most people, they had lowered expectations given the mixed reception to the trailer and this an overall apathy to live action Disney remakes because they don't, they tr- haven't really added anything to what they're adapting. They're just kind of there to be seen, make some make some dough for Disney and and Tenantain kids. Like there, there's there's a they don't set out to achieve much as films, so most people are never super hyped about them. Um but I was I was I was pleased. You know, I think it's completely inoffensive to any hardcore OG Aladdin fans. And the changes it makes, I don't think they really add anything like as saying like, it doesn't rise above the original. But it's still a lot of fun. I think most of the casting is, is done well. So it's 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 just enjoyable, you know, movie. Ultimately it's geared for kids, but I think it looks pretty good. I was concerned if this CGI might stand out and be a little stark, given they didn't shoot this whole thing in, in desert after all. But I think it looks good and it's, it's a fun ride. It's a little long, I guess. That was probably my biggest quibble with. I think it takes a while to start uh mm. pick up. But yeah, I, I was entertained. What about you? You know, when the uh, when the first like pictures of the genie came out um, and we first saw the CGI for the genie, there was a lot of backlash. People were really concerned about this film. Um, but the more and more we saw updated trailers, updated clips, it seemed like they were kind of pulling it together. And I think overall they did pull it together. I really enjoyed it. I had a good time uh, at this movie. I don't remember a lot of the plot points of the original Aladdin. I know like the general story and kind of like, how they get from point A to point B, but I I didn't recall Jasmine being as like girl power, so to speak, or, or women empowerment as uh, she was in this film, which was actually kind of like a nice uh, a nice addition. I felt like, although I do think the the speechless song was a bit like shoehorned in and felt a little out of place. Um, but overall, I thought Will Smith for having an impossible task um, of 
you know, playing an iconic role that Robin Williams personified to a T. Uh, he did a good job and he brought a lot of energy. That's really what you needed from the genie. And he definitely, I think, carries this film. But Musad is fine as Aladdin. I thought Naomi Scott as Jasmine was fantastic. Uh, Kim Zari, I was a little bit eh on. Like he was fine, but you know, to be the the big villain in this, I think at times he wasn't as intimidating or I don't know, uh, scary enough. Maybe is the right word. But overall, I thought it was a fine film and probably the best live action remake Disney's done to this point. Um, my my biggest quibble would actually be the singing. I think a lot of times was either like not the right pitch or just flat. Um, and I found that a bit just like off putting was like, you know, you're putting all this energy into getting the CGI right into making the genie have all these elaborate tricks and you aren't singing <laughs> that well in this. And uh, I thought that was a bit frustrating. But overall, had a good time at this film and uh, I-, I liked it. Yeah, I think I think there's a few things there. What do you think this is? Do you think this is the best live action remake? You have this above Beauty and the Beast 2017 and Jungle Book 2016. Yeah, uh, maybe not above Jungle Book. It's right up there. It's definitely above Beauty and the Beast for me. I think that's probably preference to the story. Um, was never a huge right. Beauty and the Beast fan, um, but also I-, I thought the live action in this, like I thought the magic carpet, which could have been a disaster, was awesome. I thought that came out great. Um, I think a lot of the live action elements of this were really, really well done. Um, And I I actually felt like the genie, which I thought was going to be incredibly scaled down because of just how much you can do with an animated film. Um, You just can't do with live action. I still think they did a lot with it. And I was really happy. Right. Yeah. So you would have those two above it, though. Yeah, I, I really like Beauty and the Beast. I like. I think it, it, it actually makes the original better because the original is super, super short. I think that added more to the plot and helped uh, explain uh, Belle's turn, right? Like, it's not straight mm. Stockholm Syndrome like it is in the cartoon. <laughs> anyway, um, these remakes should change things, right? Like, I don't want it to be a straight carbon copy, right? Like, there's, what's the point of that? And this does change things. You mentioned the genie, I think. Having Will Smith not always be blue, great mm-hmm. choice. Yeah, great. And you mentioned, I think he does carry the film, and I think it starts out a little slow, partially because the the first song, really, the Street Rat song, it's fine, but I think uh, Masood's singing is he only can do so much, so they, yeah. they have to scale it down as a result. But once the genie shows up uh, and meets Aladdin then it picks up. It gets way mm-hmm. more funny, way more frenetic, and it's just a lot a lot of fun. And basically, whenever Will Smith's on screen, he's electric, just having a ball. It's great. It's one of his best roles in a long time, to be honest. Um, Kanzari as Jafar was probably my biggest weak point, relatively speaking. I just kind of wanted Jafar to be more of a sinister character, mm. but because he, he just comes off as a much younger Jafar this time around, which is fine, but I don't know. Like it, it was tough to buy that he was an advisor to the Sultan, who's like much mm-hmm. older than him. And I like that. Like they like kind of like add to Jafar being like like Aladdin and coming up from nothing and then stealing the lamp later on. Like I believe that's all different from the cartoon. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he just wasn't quite as menacing as I wanted him to be. But it's, it's still effective. It wasn't it wasn't a weak point per se. Just kind of something I would have changed. Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing about the singing, though, is like you have to decide if you want to cast someone who's a good singer or a good actor. And I think when you're making these live action remakes, you have to prioritize the acting. Mm-hmm. And I really liked Masood as Aladdin. I thought he was really good at conveying uh, what makes Aladdin, you know, this street smart kid who is a good, well intentioned guy. But mm-hmm. they, they had him as he, you know, becomes, falls in love with the Prince Ali idea, like in the cartoon having that turn of sorts happen, I think was communicated well. I thought he did a good job. If he's not the best singer though, I think, I think it just, you just have to, ro- have to roll with it. Like, like the Mulan remake for next year. There's not, they're not even doing any songs. They're just throwing that out. But the thing I think is, is a inspired choice. Just really focus on the storytelling 
Um, now, you know, McScott as Jasmine. Jasmine's, Jasmine's kind of like a, a, a weak Disney princess as far as characters go. Like, really? She a lot in the cartoon. Oh, um, in the cartoon, yeah. Yeah, in the cartoon. She's just kind of there to be saved by Aladdin. Um, she does not have a whole lot. So I think they're actually adding the, like, mm-hmm. her desire to be Sultan. Yeah. And it's kind of giving her more to her person was 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 a good idea i think like jafar being like kind of blatantly sexist like you can't be woman and uh, uh sultan and shut up woman like all these like it's, it's a little obvious like mm-hmm. messaging there but i don't know like having naomi scott have that brand new jasmine song at the end which is not original uh works well and like she um i thought she sang pretty well and uh you mentioned the the magic carpet um uh, what's it called a whole new world? Obviously, yeah. the famous song from the cartoon that really needs to be a hit because that's not a scene you can change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought that worked well, and it looked good. You know, I, I was definitely uh, concerned that they see Jow would be poor, but they um, both acquit themselves well singing that song, and it, and it looks good. So, like I said, I think overall it's it's inoffensive, but a good time nonetheless. Yeah, I felt uh, a whole to speak on a whole new world. Uh, I felt like that was a well done scene and very effective. However, I also felt like that highlighted the uh, difference in singing ability between Scott and Musad, probably the most throughout the film, because you have uh, Musad who's like, you know, carries the first half of the song and then Jasmine comes in and Naomi Scott just like blows him away vocally. It's, it's crazy how much better she seemed to be in the film, at least. Um, what did you think of the dancing that was included in here? Because uh, I've seen some mixed reactions online to people feeling like, "God, uh, did that needed to be added in or not?" What, what, which which part? Like, I, I like the the Prince Ali entrance with the elephants mm-hmm. and the dancers. I thought and, and the song. I thought that was as extravagant as it yes. should be. That was awesome. It was really fun energy. Will Smith killing it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that looks great. But wait, is that the dancing they're referring to, or they're referring to something else? Uh, the the dancing um, when he's trying to like woo jasmine as oh, Prince the b- backflip a little much right yeah uh, <laughs> um i don't know i didn't i didn't mind it was kind of cool seeing will smith go like all like marionette on a ladder yeah. whatever yeah it was it wasn't a big thing for me i actually felt like i really enjoyed the dancing and like at the the po- post credits or like the credit scene where they're doing a bit of like a bollywood type um like breakdown i thought it was actually kind of yeah. fun i'd like to see them do um like more of that sort of stuff um to kind of give a shout out to these cultural reg- regions um as they make these live uh live action films and, and adaptations um one i mean alan tudyk is credited as i think playing iago in this mm-hmm. and iago in the animated film is like a whole comedic actor in and of his own right and this was a very scaled down Iago role. How did you feel about that choice? Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not Gilbert Gottfried, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Scaled down is exactly the way to put it. He just doesn't really add much. He just kind of like, I guess he's there for the kids watching to communicate mm-hmm. in broad strokes what characters are thinking or what action is happening on screen. Like exactly, he does not have any good lines and. At the end, he briefly becomes like this mutant pterodactyl ass parrot, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shout out Disney. You always need to have some kind of chase scene at the end. Yep. With CGI. <laughs> Thankfully, it doesn't last too long, but uh, definitely made me raise my eyebrow when I, when I, when I watched it unfold. Um, yeah, he uh, yeah, doesn't, doesn't add anything, unfortunately. But I thought uh, Abu, yes, despite being a looks like a real monkey, uh, both funny. I think right away they uh, the dynamic with Aladdin is conveyed well, and the first real plot point that Abu pushes when he falls in love with the red jewel in the cave uh, would look good and work well. So I think Abu uh, was much better, and only he's more important character than Iago. Iago is kind of like supplementary, but yeah, a uh, bit of a disappointment that both Iago and Jafar, to a lesser extent, are a bit of weak points considering they are pretty important to the storytelling yeah it just feels like a waste of alan tudyk honestly because he's such a, a great actor you know he's been awesome as uh yeah, you know in all the star wars films he's been doing and just like yeah k2 he's been great so um 
Yeah, I don't know. I think the last thing I just wanted to say was I was really impressed with Masad and uh, and Scott in this because when you're on screen with someone like Will Smith and he's so so established and bringing so much energy, I think it could have been really easy for them to kind of like shrink away in, in that face. I felt like they really like held their own in the scenes with him. And they I, th- I thought especially him and Masad had a really good chemistry um that shown through and and was a good driver of the movie for the second half especially as you know kind of the the conflict starts to arise more so right uh, I, I just thought that was impressive if we remember back um when they when they announced this naomi scott was cast as jasmine first and that was something we were actually both happy about she had kind of bust on the scene with the power rangers remake but it's kind of been pegged as a up-and-coming star for a while but it took them a while to find their aladdin and arguably that's a more important casting choice to nail. And I, I, again, I was really impressed with them finding Masood. You know, that was a he he was good, and he was certainly not a well known guy before. I think they they auditioned tons of people, and he won out, and that was, that was great. Did you recognize who played the Sultan? By the way, no, that's a uh, Navid Niga Nigaban, who we know as Farouk from Legion. Ah, damn, yeah. I would not have ever uh noticed that that's that's awesome though um you know i I think basically to wrap to summarize it uh aladdin though not a not a perfect film um does enough to be enjoyable and it's worth a watch Uh, much better than dumbo yeah i mean i didn't see it but i would i would believe that and you can watch this for seven what seven dollars a month starting november 12th uh, on Disney Plus, so probably, That's probably right. one of the first um, 2019 films put on there. And uh, while Great. we're here, what's your energy on the next remakes? We have obviously Lion King, which I'm sure everyone saw a trailer for when they saw Aladdin that comes mm-hmm. out in July, and then also probably lesser known to most people, Lady and the Tramp, day and date on Disney Plus, November 12th, Justin Theroux and Tessa Thompson. Those are the two we have this next year or this year, and then in March we have Mulan, which just finished filming. Um, Lady and the Tramp, uh, my hype is at basically a zero <laughs> and Lion King. My hype is at like an 80 right now of a hundred. I'm, I'm excited for it. I'm not like over the moon, but this, this didn't do anything to hurt it. I'll put it that way. What about you? I'm real. I'm really hyped for Mulan. One of my favorite Disney Renaissance movies, but I mentioned it's not being a musical, but the lead actress, um, mentioned that it's like the most expensive Disney movie ever. It's like $300 million. Mm. And if you think about Mulan, it's truly an epic story. Yeah. And just thinking that Disney's like really putting out to make this look as fucking badass as you expect it to be is fucking really exciting. So I'm looking forward to that in March. That movie will make a man out of you, Dave. And uh, <laughs> uh, we're on to next week, dude. So what are we talking about next week? Yeah. So as you mentioned, there's a lot of music we didn't talk about this week that we'll get to. Um, YG. YG. Steve Lacey, Flying Lotus, Flying Lotus, as well as records coming out on Friday, Denzel Curry and Skepta, all artists we don't want to miss and they're worth talking about. So we'll get to them. Also, we'll catch up on the Killing Eve season two finale, the full season, Fosse version, as you mentioned. Also, uh, Chernobyl. We haven't talked about that at all. Quick five episode series on HBO. Uh, and of course, Booksmart, which I've already seen. I believe you've already seen it too. We haven't talked about it yet. Uh, well, it's Godzilla King of Monsters and Rocket Man. Hell of stuff, but that's summer for you, man. Lots of stuff to talk about. Yeah, so hit that subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, go to soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod to find all the ways that you can listen to the podcast. And lastly, give us a five star rating and review on iTunes. We appreciate all, all the love. We appreciate all the support. We'll see you next week. <laughs>